for you tonight, a Grammy nominated producer, Grammy winning producer, Hotline Bling, Truffle Butter, One Dance, and One Half of Division. Give it up, 1985. How's it going? Not bad. How about you? I'm good. So I wanted to start this off. You're from Scarborough, right? Um, would, would you rap Scarborough? Or? Toronto originally. I actually grew up in Pickering. Pickering? Yeah, way out east. Okay. So did, you, did, you, did you grow up in Scarborough a little bit? Like uh, you lived there? A lot of my family grew up in Scarborough. So okay. I was in and out all the time, but I actually literally grew up in Pickering. Oh, because I had a very Scarborough-centric question for you. What was that? Well, um, I was just reading, there's this tweet going around right now. The leader of NDP, uh, Jagmeet Singh, he says, you can take the Ute out of Scarborough, but you can't take the Scarborough out of the Ute. That's very true. And it, I wanted to want, know, what, what does that mean to you? Um, Scarborough, much like anywhere in Toronto, is one of those places where no matter where you go in the world, the experiences you got there, back home, will kind of never leave you. So it is what it is. Cool. Okay. Well, I mean, it's like... So I read something that said that you're, you originally started with the guitar. Yes. Um, that you saved up for money on your on a paper route yes. to get. Um, you were in some bands yeah. originally? Um, like you were in like some punk bands, I read? Yeah. So for those that were in Pickering, I used to deliver the news advertiser and um, saved up enough money to just buy a guitar and basically just taught myself by listening to songs I loved and figure out how to play those. And then... What songs? Um, it was like Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. You know, just like classic rock songs. Mm -hmm. And then um, all of my friends at the time were into like punk music. So we just started a punk band and went from there. Uh, what were the names of some of the bands you were in? The worst names ever. I, mean, I want to know. <laughs> uh, like Coffee Double the Cream, Odd Man <laughs> Out. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> so you're in these punk bands. How do you transition from you know playing guitar into starting to make beats? Like when when did that happen for you? Um, I sort of fell into it. Uh, at the time. I don't think I, I knew I wanted to produce, but one thing I've always wanted to do is DJ. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do now, and back then I always wanted to get into uh, DJing. And in high school, the girl I was dating, her older brother was a DJ. So one day I was actually gonna ask him to like teach me some stuff about DJing. And he's like, oh, I heard you play guitar. Do you mind like playing guitar on some tracks for me? I was like, yeah, cool, whatever. And then he's like, well, what about bass? Can you play bass? I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. And he's like, well, can you put down some drums too? And I was like, uh, okay. And he's like, there, you just made a song, you produced. And I was like, what does that even mean? And he's like, you just made all the music to the song. You, you could be a producer. And then literally from there, I sort of just like went backwards and did my research on like what producers were, you know? Yeah, so it was almost out of like necessity. Like you just started doing it and it's like, oh, this is the way that you think it's supposed to be. Yeah, I, I really just fell into it. And then from there, because I'd already been in bands and I'd already been writing songs and doing all the different parts, the rest of the stuff sort of made sense to me, even though I didn't know what I was doing. So you go from like playing all these instruments, um, what kind of hardware and software were you using around that time? Like when, like, well like, Back then, though, back in the day, like what kind of? Back then, when I first started producing, yeah, I was using a uh, version of Cubase that somebody had given to me, and I literally just like figured it out from there. And so, how long were you using that? Like, what was your like workflow? Like, when you started like making beats for yourself, that would, like. Um, back then, I think I always started with samples because samples to me were the closest thing to like band music mm -hmm. and so that was like super familiar for me and then I would just add drums and play stuff around it but then as I started to get a little bit more comfortable with my own sound I just got um what did I get I had a Korg Triton 
and I had a Roland Phantom X6, and I just started like adding some new sounds to my beats. So when was the moment where you realized that you actually had your own sound? Um, I think like right off the bat, I sort of had my own sound. I, I don't even think it was an intentional, it just happened like that because I, I came from such a odd place. Like my production was based on so much different than anybody else I knew that made beats. What, what was it based on? Just the, the live instrumentation? Like, yeah, it was yeah. just based on me like being in bands. You know, I, like I'm saying, I, I never really wanted to be a producer. I fell into that. Uh, it's interesting. This is actually kind of the opposite that yeah. most people go. Like usually they start off like only samples and I'm just making beats and then like, oh, maybe I should learn an instrument. Or, yeah. But it was the opposite way for you. And I think because of that, my sound has always been slightly different. And then also at the same time, I always wanted to be a DJ. So everything I do is still sort of drum driven at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So... So, did you like? Were you really, when you're making these beats? Were you really super interested in working with other artists, or like, were you, like, when, when was the first time like you gave, got a beat for somebody and they recorded over it? Um, I think I always wanted to just make like heavy rap beats, you know. So, <laughs> like, all the guys that I knew were rapping, so I was just like, oh, I can make beats for you guys. You know, I didn't really know what I was getting into. But I was just like, yeah, I'll, I'll make beats for you guys. And that was what I liked to do anyways. What were some of the rap names? Like, who, who, who were they? Um, they were just my friends, so they right. didn't have rap names. <laughs> <laughs> right, just the homies. Yeah. Um, did you learn anything different about your beats once you started like hearing people over them? Uh, yeah, I think I learned that most of the stuff I was doing was way too busy. I would mm -hmm. add like 30 different sounds when I could have used two, you know, and I think the more I started working with artists and singers especially, I started realizing that less is more. You know, mm -hmm. like I think less is always more in production. Yeah, I actually read a tweet of yours where you say uh, some of the best songs are the most simple. It's true, it's true. Um, I think when I first started producing, I was producing to impress myself. You mm -hmm. know, just kind of like doing stuff that I thought was cool that for an artist is almost impossible to rap over or sing over. Mm -hmm. And then when I really learned my job as a producer is to pretty much paint the canvas for the artist to go, you know, I think that's when I was like, okay, let me fall back a bit and let this like artist live for a bit. Yeah, I think that's something that happens like with a lot of producers when they first start out, because I know it was the same for me, where it's like you are kind of selfish. Yeah. You know, like you're just trying to make the coolest thing possible to you. Definitely. With no audience in mind. Yeah, and then um, one thing I remember is every time I would send beats to, well, I still have the same management, they'd be like, oh, this eight seconds at the beginning is fire. And I was like, yeah, but what about the rest? He's like, no, 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 this intro, <laughs> crazy. Or he'd be like, oh, that little 10 second loop at the end of it, that's crazy, send me that. And I was just like, yeah, but there's three minutes and 25 seconds in between there. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, but this part right here. And that's when I really learned like, oh, maybe I don't need to put like 32 sections in my beats. It's like they want to sample your beats. Yeah. You know, get the so, good, the dope loop. It's true. Um, so that was your workflow back then. like. What kind of gear are you using right now? Um, right now, I really try to keep it minimal, I think because I'm on the road so much. Mm -hmm. So uh, because of that, uh, I literally just have my laptop, Ableton. I, one thing I really do like is mm -hmm. I like the fact that with machine, I can use it in my software without actually having to have the hardware with me. And that's one thing that I I've always like had a problem with when you get used to your hardware and you can't bring it on the road with you. Yeah, no, so, that's rare. Yeah, so I'm I'm always like afraid to really get used to like a hardware piece and then I have to go somewhere and I can't bring it. So I've always just tried to keep it as simple as possible. So you're like you're like an Ableton guy. Yeah, for yeah, sure. definitely. For sure. Um, what what kind of um, native instruments like, you know? Oh, I swear by Contact. Yeah, like what what are, what are your favorite Contact? Um, I find all the strings and contacts sound really good. Uh, the pianos, for sure, sound really good. I like stuff that sounds like it was actually played by somebody. <laughs> yeah, you know? human yeah. music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you like music. And, and that's not to say that like certain synth sounds don't work, but it's just like, 
I think once again, because I came from using like bands as my foundation, mm -hmm. I've always still tried to like find that in my music. You know, even a lot of the samples I use, if I sample guitars, a lot of times it sounds like something I could have played. And even if I play something, a lot of times it sounds like something I would have sampled, you know? Right. So, I mean, you're making these beats, you're starting to get some placements here and there. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your relationship with 40. Um, smart guy. Um, yeah, give it up for 40. <laughs> are we in Toronto or are we in Toronto? Let's do it. 40 is, um, I think just one of the few people that really understood what I was doing long before I had any hits or any recognition because he could hear those little pieces in my beats that other people weren't hearing. And he was, you know, he's like one of the main reasons that I just learned to like really simplify and find the best section of whatever I was making. Because I remember once Forty said to me, he's just like, look, if you can find the right two bar loop, that's your song. You know, it doesn't need to be 16 bars, doesn't need to be these crazy chord changes. He's like, just do what sounds right and what feels right. And then from there, I think that kind of like changed my whole approach to how I produced. Yeah, I feel like a lot of producers or you may, you know, might feel a little discouraged when somebody would tell them that. It'd be like, oh, I thought everything was so dope. I want to do the crazy thing. Like, did, did you, you, you were just like, yeah. Um, no, I, I never really took offense to that. To me, I was kind of just like, that to me that was like what I needed because I I had no real success before then and I was still just searching yeah like I'm sure a bunch of the producers here are just kind of like trying to figure out well what's next like I can just keep making beats forever and playing them in my house and my parents hear them or my brother hears them They're like oh you're good but where does it go from there so to finally have somebody who knew what they were doing actually be able to pinpoint something in my beat and be like this right here is good, but you don't need all of the other stuff. Or you could have just looped this alone and that would have been great. I think that really like opened up a lot for me. So that's like, that, that's the experience yeah. factor, right? Yeah. Like knowing what works and being able to like relay that to you. 100%. So, you know, when you, when you start working more and more with him and with other producers, I find this is a big thing in Toronto is the collaborative element with a lot of beats. Mm -hmm. You know, you've done a lot of stuff with uh, Boy Wonder, mm -hmm. you know, um, and 40 and, you know, so so many different producers. Like, what is it like working with, maybe having your one part of a song as a larger whole? Like, what is it um, working with that process? I think the really cool thing with, not just my team and the guys I work closely with, but a lot of the guys in Toronto, we're not afraid to let somebody like add to your production or take away. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of other places I've gone, there's always like this weird ego thing of like, uh, I'm, I'm cool, I don't really need your input or <laughs> I don't need your drums. Or we're here, we're just kind of like, oh, you have drums, sick, send them. You know, oh, you like this loop? All right, I'll send it to you, do what you can do. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, that alone is why Toronto right now is sort of like, I think reshaping how a lot of other people are looking at production especially. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many producers in Toronto that way before we were known had already worked with all the other producers that are known now. You know, from, you know, like Francis, who was just up here a few minutes ago. I worked with mm -hmm. Francis years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, now everybody else is knowing like Francis is dope. I've known that, you know, and I've worked with him and he's worked with Wonder Girl, who's worked with Boy Wonder, who's worked with 40, who's worked with me. And he's I think just kind of like keeps all, these people. all of these guys. And I think um, that like uh, fearlessness is something that a lot of producers can definitely gain from, you know, because you never know what artist or what um, avenue this other producer you're working with has you know so me just sending you this random snare or whatever could be the one thing that finishes the big song for beyonce but you didn't know mm -hmm. i was working with beyonce but you were just cool sending it mm -hmm. you know yeah i think that kind of um not having any like expectations of what will happen within the end I yeah. think helps a lot 100 percent. so you're talking about fearlessness let's talk about fearlessness okay let's talk about hotline bling Okay. Okay. Well, because you won the Grammy for best rap song mm -hmm. uh, for this song, and 
you know, just when I first heard it, and you think about the sample, I don't think it's going to be like, I don't associate with like an upbeat sound, personally. I find the original sample kind of mournful, kind of sad, kind of like wistful almost. But then obviously it's become this like huge like party banger, this huge track. Sure. So like how, how did this song come together? Um, that's a weird one because that, that is probably the only time I've heard a sample and instantly known the beat in my head before making it. And that came because I was driving my car, it came on satellite radio, I heard the sample, and instantly in my head, I knew, actually I'll tell you guys, I knew that if I could put drums that had a similar bounce to Fetty Wap's My Way, I was like, it's out of here. <laughs> and I did that, and instantly Drake knew what to do with it, where normally I take way longer to make beats mm -hmm. than that, but that one, before I even got home, the beat was done in my head. I mean, I've heard that before, like, you know, some of the best songs, like, come to you very quickly. Yeah. You know, and that seems like a real big instance for of that. For sure, for sure. And so what was it like experiencing, like, the reaction to that song? Like, because it went, it went crazy. Like, just um, with the video, with everything. Like, it was such a huge track. I think that's also one of the songs where I knew it was going to have that reaction because when Drake first played it for me, I didn't know what to expect. I had sent it to him. He's like, yeah, I'm done. And I was just like, you're yeah, done. He's really? like, yeah, yeah, I'm done. So when I finally went to the studio to hear it, he played it for me once, and I was kind of just like, oh, that's not what I had expected to hear. And then maybe like five minutes later, I walked out of the room and I was singing the whole song. And I was just like, whoa, <laughs> I've only heard the song one time. You know, so I think it kind of had the same effect on everybody. Well, yeah, that's just like hearing something, you know, yeah, give it up for that. This, this is like amazing. But yeah, that's something to be said for um, hearing something that maybe not other people will hear in, in a sample. And I feel like that's kind of like a cornerstone of your sound. Yeah. I noticed <laughs> I that. So. I mean, like you look at like Truffle Butter and One Dance, both mm -hmm. those songs sample kind of UK mm -hmm. like club hits, you know? Like, yeah. I mean, like in the case of the Kyla track, it was like a pretty big track. Yeah. Um, what would make you think, let's make a rap song out of those beats? Because it's not straightforward that you would do that um truffle butter mm -hmm. i heard that loop and i was like if i slow this down <laughs> there's just something about it that's so infectious that no matter what it's gonna work and uh the thing with uk is their their grooves are a little bit different than what we're used to in north america especially right now you know, this it's normally a little bit faster than what we're used to. Mm -hmm. So I normally tend to slow their stuff down, which is the same thing I did again with One Dance. Yeah. Um, with One Dance, I remember literally the first time Boy Wonder heard work, the first time Boy Wonder heard One Dance, he literally called me like instantly leaving the studio and he's like, yo, you have your first number one. You've definitely made like the biggest song of your career. <laughs> That's a smash. And I was just like, really? And he's like, 100%. He's like, that's the one. And I was just like, like, how do you know? He's like, I know. He's like, I know, this is the one. <laughs> and I, he's been right. <laughs> so, so you've toured around England before. Mm -hmm. Like, what is it about like the UK club like experience? Because there's a culture there. There's like this, a, a different kind of dance music culture there. That's kind um, of hard to, hard to explain. There's a few things. I think they've always been a little bit ahead of us in the disco or EDM world. Mm -hmm. And I think they've always been very accepting of Caribbean culture. And they've figured out ways to mix those things, much like Toronto, but the rest of North America hasn't. You know, I think they've always been um, a little bit ahead of North America especially. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why Toronto has always really connected with them for mm -hmm. that because of those similarities. And you know, even now as One Dance, Controller, Blem, all these songs come out, to a, to a lot of people in the States, it's like, oh, you guys have suddenly found this like island culture. Yeah, it's where, like this new thing. Yeah, yeah. Where in Toronto, we've all grown up on that. You could be Italian and you you have the best, you know, the best like knowledge of old reggae and dance hall and soca and calypso whereas if you're not from here it's really hard to understand that mm -hmm. you know and i think this is the first time 
in mainstream North American pop music that they've seen the blending of the two, where it wasn't just like a reggae artist like Sean Paul mm -hmm. just put out straight reggae songs and those songs did well. You know, these are rap, R&B, pop artists putting out these songs that have these influences. And it's like a hybrid. Like it's yeah, not, for sure. It's not like, before you used to have people like, oh yeah, like reggae's popping, like let's do like a dance hall track and it's like almost like an imitation of just dance hall. Whereas like a lot of these tracks, they have like this, not only do they, they they resonate with people here and UK people um, because of the same like cultures are surrounding them, but it's also just a totally new thing too. Like it's 100%. like its own yeah. thing. Like especially like you hear like like Blam or like One Dance. Like it's like there's this un intangible kind of like world yeah. music element to them that like is hard to put your finger on. I think that's what makes it so universal. The interesting thing is when I was doing One Dance, I was referencing. African music and reggaeton. Everybody keeps saying, oh, you have this reggae thing, where to me it's not that, but to a lot of people, especially on this side of the world, they don't have another reference beyond just like, oh, it's reggae, right? you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I definitely got the reggaeton vibe, just like, just the speed of it, too. Yeah, like it just fits sure. in perfectly. For sure. You know, so you definitely have that dance music vibe. I mean, what? What can you tell me about your, your, your own group, Division? I want to talk about Division. Um, because, you know, give it up for Division. Got that new album just dropped, Thank you. Morning After. Um, how did Division come together? Division is uh, me and my longtime friend and writing partner, Daniel Daly, kind of owning and, embr and embracing what we've been doing for so long but just on a more public scale. Because a lot of the stuff we were doing with Division is, um, it kind of started by us trying to pitch those songs to other artists. Mm. You know, we've pitched a couple of the songs, even on September 5th, to other artists who loved the songs, but then a lot of times the response we would get from either the artist or their team is, would you be able to send like a different demo or, there was always something about the demo where I think it was almost intimidating when you have somebody sing the song <laughs> right. that well as the demo, you know? And there was always this kind of like, well, why don't you just put it out? And we were like, who? You know, because we did it as demos. And they're just like, right. whoever the artist is, like, is it like, the, like, isn't that an artist? Like, and we were just like, uh, oh, yeah, you know? Like, <laughs> it kind of took us a little while to embrace it, like, oh, maybe we should be the artist, and maybe we should own that a little bit more. Wow, that's, that's crazy, because it's like, I, I read that you guys kind of, the way that you guys write together is you'll kind of like jam out. Yeah, it's, um, it's really unorthodox, because there's no starting point. Like, literally, I'll start with a, a beat and a hook, He'll start with an idea. He might send me a, a little piano loop he's made. It's kind of just anywhere that we find a great idea and just being able to build on that. So would you say, I, this is what I've noticed with a lot of the Division stuff, is it's like, it seems like it's almost like your like str stranger impulses and like some of the weirder directions you'll go in. It's like an outlet for some of that stuff. Yeah, for sure, because this is, I think for the both of us, the both of us this is the first time that we can really just go in our own direction completely and there's no rules you know there's no guidelines we just kind of do what we do i know this particularly with like the title track morning after mm -hmm. i really like that song a lot mm -hmm. i feel like there's something it makes me feel like you're like in ibiza <laughs> we actually made that in miami okay and we're uh <laughs> enjoying the influence of all that Miami has to offer. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was us like also embracing a more upbeat um, direction for this new album. And like this is another song where I feel like it's kind of like, it has this like world element. Like I don't, I can't place my finger on like yeah, the guitar. Yeah, it sort of doesn't sound like any one style of music or from any one place. It's almost like Balkan music or something. Like I don't know. It's, it's just, just good music. <laughs> Good music, yeah. I mean, I guess that kind of like those intangible sounds, like that's what people latch on to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so like, what is, what's it like 
producing for like a project like this where it's um, the same vocalist and you're working together like very frequently versus just it, like making a beat with like for one single for an artist or something like what do you find is different between those processes um i think i've been really fortunate in that i've actually been able to spend a lot of time building with the artists that most of my stuff have come out with you know when drake is working on an album we're kind of all there building for the duration of the album. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the vision. Whereas a lot of times with other producers, a lot of their work is just like, you kind of send out tracks and you wait to see the response, which I've done as well. Mm -hmm. And I found that for me, I always get the most response when I actually have a chemistry with the artist. You know, There's a lot of beats where I feel like if I had just sent those beats to random artists, I don't know if I would have a hotline bling right now. Right, you wouldn't get the same result. 100%. You know? you know, it's like, so how important is like catching a vibe in the studio for it's, you? It's everything. You know, I think if there's no vibe, it, it's very easy to make uh, replaceable music, you know? And I've been blessed with a lot of songs that I think will last past whatever the fad is at the moment or whatever is happening in music right now. I think a lot of the songs I've done will outlast that just because the vibe of those songs and the way they make people feel is so much stronger than just something that was here for a little bit and then gone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was, we were talking before, you were saying you, you use machine, but just native instruments, what influence have they had on your music? Like, what kind of other stuff have you used native instruments? Um, like, a battery or control or anything? I love the drums and battery. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I really loved about Machine is that same guy who had kind of like introduced me into producing, he was completely on MPC. And MPC is like, well, now it seems a little bit like a different style from a lot of the guys that are using FL and um, Logic and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But there's something different about being able to like actually like touch the buttons, you know? I, I don't know how to explain it. Even though mm -hmm. something different without with being able to like just play keys on a keyboard as opposed to just drawing in, drawing it in. Mm -hmm. And I think I always really loved how M MPC was kind of transformed in what they've done with the machine and how you can kind of get that same feel, but it works so well with Ableton, for example, or. Yeah, they've, they've kind of taken that spirit, but yeah. you know, integrating it with the software is in the machine too. It's exactly. like you can you can do a lot of it in the box. Like yeah. it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um. So I got a couple more questions for you, and then I was gonna open it up to Q and A. Don't oh, cool. Um. But this is a this is kind of a, a large question, and it's something that I think a lot of producers from here are getting asked. Mm -hmm. The Toronto sound. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the Toronto sound? Um, for the most part, I always found it to be a little bit darker than a little bit darker than what was coming out of the states. I found a little bit um, I don't want to say filtered, but a little bit not as like clean and polished, distorted. Or yeah, a little bit dirtier. Uh, I think a lot of that comes from just like being in a cold place and you know you have so many months where you're just like inside um i think it's also a little bit slower you know we're only just now starting to like pick up the tempo and even when we did a lot of times that came in the form of like island influence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know i definitely think the island influence of toronto is influencing all music right now and Obviously, the island influence of Toronto is the islands, but I think the way that we've used it is being used across the board now. Yeah, it's become more influential, like outside of here too. Definitely, you know, where it's like, you know, if you're from here, you know, like yeah, Caravana, like yeah, you must come, right? Yeah, that like the rest of the world didn't know that until now, and now it's like yeah, and I Obvio also Fest is you know for sure. The, for the sure. weekend, you know? I think another thing about Toronto Sound is we have a really great ear for R&B and we have a really great ear for sampling. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think the way that we've done that is something that I think the rest of the world has actually, like, taken 
and like used as a blueprint for a lot of what's going on right now, you know? And, and what is it that drew you to R&B? Because you were just talking about that. Um, like, what is it about R&B music? Just great songs that you can feel, you know? You, we all have a song that reminds us of some girl, you know? There's, there's always something that makes you remember a certain time in your life with R&B. Same thing with rap, but I think with R&B, I, it's so much easier based on the stories. Yeah. Okay, and I have one more question. Um, this is for everybody who's here, I guess. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give a young producer here in Toronto, you know, trying to make a name for themselves? What advice would you give to the um, people here? I think it's good to know what all of the other producers are doing, and I think you still do kind of have to follow their their lead a bit, but don't be afraid to just like slightly just do your own thing because right now it's so easy to sound like everybody else but there's already a boy wonder a metro booming a 40 you know there's so many spots that are being filled that instead of just sounding like them because those guys are still here and still making great music kind of just like learn from them and then take it your own direction thank you